Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, I hate to be the only thing standing between you and free food, but <laughs> I'll do my best. Uh, when I was in high school, I was really involved with technology, in particular computer technology. Um, I took all the courses you could take. Um, I actually helped a teacher teach a computer class that I'd already taken myself as a student. So when it came time to um, apply to university, um, I thought, okay, uh, I'm going to continue along the stream. It seems like it's an interesting thing, rewarding thing to do. What happened was, back then, there wasn't any computer engineering. Uh, it used to be called, electric, fitted in under electrical engineering. So that's what I applied for, electrical engineering. Three schools, U of T, um, Queens, and Waterloo. And I got accepted to all three, except at U of T, um, I only got accepted in my second choice, industrial engineering. And my parents didn't have a lot of money, and I like living at home, has certain benefits, personal family and all that. Um, so I thought, uh, I talked to some people, and they said, well, if you do well in first year at U of T, then in second year you can switch into electrical engineering, you'll be fine. So that's what I decided to do, went to U of T industrial engineering. And then I came across um, a professor by the name of Pat Foley, um, who was teaching, um, uh, gave a lecture on not just technology, but the interaction between people and technology, two sides of a puzzle that intimately fit together. Um, and he gave uh, actually a number of very interesting examples. One of them was um, a study that looked at the heart rate of pilots um, as a function of where they are in the flight. And what they found was that at the beginning of the flight, takeoff, and at the end, at landing, the uh, heart rate went up like crazy. Um, so the obvious conclusion is if you want to improve safety in a cockpit, you should address those two phases of flight because they're the most important. So I learned about this and I thought, this is much more fun than electrical engineering, just looking at chips and hardware and software by themselves without any people. So I didn't switch into electrical engineering. I stayed in industrial engineering and I got into the area that's now known as human tech uh, engineering. And I did um, all three of my degrees in this area. Um, and uh, that's how I got into the career that I'm at still to this very day. Now, um, take you back a bit in time, uh, shortly after what I've described. In July of 1992, I got hired as a tenure track assistant professor here at U of T. And a um, man came into my office and he said, um, are you a human tech guy? And I said, yeah, who the hell are you? I mean, he just came out like out of nowhere, right? And he explained that he was a biomedical engineer, but also an anesthesiologist, and he wanted to look at human tech in the contents, context of medical device design. So I just got here, I didn't have a whole lot going on, didn't have many students, didn't have um, any research programs, so I agreed to do it. So what we had to do, of course, is to pick a particular medical device. You can't just do it on like all devices. There are hundreds of thousands of medical devices. Q-tip is actually a medical device, believe it or not. So we wound up picking something that's called uh, PCA, Patient Controlled Analgesia. Um, I'll explain how that works in a second, but you have to understand how um, uh, morphine is usu was usually administered manually. Um, the way it works is someone's in a hospital, they experience pain, they press the button to call the nurse. The nurse gets there, and now you're even more pain. Um, you say, I, my leg hurts or whatever. They go away, they go to a medicine cabinet, they have to sign out the morphine, come back. By this time, you're in a lot of pain. And the curse, nurses can't go there every five minutes to give you morphine. So when they give you a dose, they give you a pretty big dose. So what happens with the manual administration of morphine is people go through these peaks and troughs of uh, severe pain and severe uh, over sedation. And over sedation can mean you're just a bit groggy or it can mean you're like a right stone that you can't talk to family members or they're to visit you. So neither one of these is acceptable. So what people did was they came up with uh, this patient controlled analgesia device. Um, there are many on the market. We looked at one particular one. And, uh, but basically the way they work is that the interface for the patient is very simple. There's a little button that you press um, when you're in pain and you get a small dose of morphine. Um, now, the, the complicated part is the interface for the nurse. Um, the, the devices have to be programmed by a nurse, and there are uh, several parameters that have to be programmed. So one is what's called the uh, lockout interval, which means if I press the button, get a dose now, what's the soonest I can get another dose? Usually it's at least four or five minutes. Um, so that's very important, otherwise you can be pressing the button all the time and getting you know, high all the time. Um, so that's to prevent that. Uh, the other thing that you can program is um, a four-hour window, which is the max amount of morphine you get over any moving four-hour window. Again, it's a safety feature. And you also have to program the concentration of morphine, because that can come in different kinds of concentrations, different vials and different morphines. So what this tries to do is to try and give people, instead of tops and valleys, they try to give people many but small doses of morphine so to better control pain. Now, um, so that's the device that we picked. We picked it also because it was relatively new at the time. And the second thing is that um, nurses were complaining about it, that they were having problems using it. 
So the first thing we did, because um, you always do this as a human tech person, is you ask your users. You go interview them, see what's going on. So we asked the nurses. And the first thing they said is, you care about what we think? <laughs> and we were like, well, yeah. I mean, who else are we going to talk to about this? <laughs> right? uh, no one's ever asked us this before. Um, it was a really an eye-opener. Whenever you do a human tech research and your users tell you they've never been consulted in the design or anything of a product, that's a really big red flag. Um, the other thing we learned is a training of this is called in-service training. It lasts about 30 minutes, uh, one time only. So that's a bit of a uh, red flag also. So I don't have time to get into all of the details, but basically what we did, we did a complete overhaul of the design of the, the PCA part, the interface part for the nurse. And we programmed it on a PC, uh, PC computer, uh, both the commercially existing device and the, uh, the newer device that we had uh, redesigned. We did a number of things. I can't tell you what they all are. Um, we changed the labels because some of the labels are a bit counterintuitive. Uh, but the main thing we did was we changed the outline, uh, the workflow. So, for example, in the previous design, the commercially available one, um, th there would be three questions in a row. Do you want option A, yes or no? Do you want option B, yes or no? Do you want option C, yes or no? They're actually the same question with three options. So what we did is say, which do you want, A, B, or C? So we went from three to one. Really complicated. No one had ever done this before. Um, anyway, uh, it looked like we were onto something, but you know, as you know, you have to do uh, uh, experiments to see how things pan out. Um, the first experiment we did was with nursing students, um, and the idea there is that they're sort of a clean slate, so they don't have experience with the commercial device, and they don't have any uh, experience with the device that we created, so it's a, bit, a fair comparison, a balanced comparison. Um, each nurse uh, programmed the, the interface with either, what, excuse me, first one pump, interface then second and second one. Um, and what we found was that the redesign uh, uh, reduced error, human error, by over 50%. Okay? And this is just the course of an experiment that lasts about an hour. So we thought that was quite encouraging, but we thought, um, well, what, what does this tell you about how actual nurse, professional nurses would uh, benefit from this, or would they even benefit from this? Um, so we did the same experiment, but with professional nurses. Um, and these are people who had years of experience with the existing interface of the commercially available one. And they never seen ours. And they got half an hour of ours and years with the existing one. So right away you're expecting the results to be slanted in favor of the old one just because of exposure. Well guess what? No, it didn't happen. Over 50% reduction in errors of even with uh, professional nurses. So that was really quite an interesting example. Um, the other thing that's important about this in both the experiments, um, the, the people are the same. Right, in the experiments, it's the same people who use the old design and the new design. Um, in the medicine, as you probably know, that sometimes a lot of, a lot of the blame goes to the end user when, when something goes wrong. Um, if the problem was uh, shoddy nursing, um, then the, the deficiency should go up in both designs. But it's not what we found. These people were the same, the design was different, and the results were different as a function of the design itself. So we were encouraged by that. Um, and, but then we started thinking, well, how, how big of a problem is this exactly? Uh, is this something that just causes people harm once in a while, or you know, what is it exactly? So we did a, a study where we looked at a number of sources, mainly the FDA database, where they, um, people send in reports about uh, medical devices. Um, and we looked at uh, literally over tens of thousands of these reports, um, uh, mainly on microfiche. Um, and what we find is that there were about five to eight reports of patient death from, con uh, from concentration programming errors, people getting too much morphine in their blood and uh, dying. Um, it turns out that, that five to eight is quite misleading because, um, as you probably know, in medicine and other areas as well, actually, um, incidents are underreported. If you look at the experiments that have been done on this, somewhere between 1.2% and 7.7% of incidents actually get reported. So what that means is you have to do those, use those two numbers as multipliers um, to figure out the estimated number of people who actually died. Five to seven is the tip of the iceberg. Five to eight is the tip of the iceberg. So we did that, we did the math, and it came out to about 60 to 600 deaths, uh, which is really quite an astonishing uh, set of numbers. Um, the, luckily, we were able to get um, from the manufacturer, they didn't do this on purpose, but um, they said the device has been used safely over 22 million times, uh, and that's a denominator. You rarely get a denominator to calculate uh, ratios for safety. Uh, again, all areas, not just medicine. So if you do the math again, it comes out to about 1 in 30,000 to 1 in 300,000. Um, and so you can take your own conclusions about whether is that safe, is that uh, acceptable, um, it's up to you. But the key thing is that 
the number of experiments that have been shown now that there is an alternative and it does result in a, a ra radical decrease in human error. So what I've described today is actually just one design. Right? It's just one device that's in a category of devices, PCA pumps in general. Um, and PCA pumps in general are a category of medical devices in general. Um, and then medical devices are a part of healthcare itself. So what you have is actually a nested set of issues here. Um, and I think that the conclusion goes well beyond PCAs and morphine and so on. It's much, much broader than that. And I think what you can say is that there are probably uh, many, many improvements um, to be had by adopting human tech approach in healthcare as a whole. And I think this audience is very prepared uh, to take that on. Thank you.